This week's episode of Millions of Screens is sponsored by Friends. Ben, are you excited? I love the television show Friends, and I am so happy to support people watching it again on HBO Max in its entirety, all 10 seasons. Well, this week's episode is brought to you by Friends The Reunion, nominated for four Emmys, including an outstanding variety special, streaming now on HBO Max. Hello and welcome to Millions of Screens. I'm co producer Leo Garcia, joined as always via Zoom by TV Awards editor Libby Hill and TV Deputy Editor Ben Travers on today's episode, a very special interview with Hacks co-creators, Lucia Agnello, Paul W. Downs, and Jen Statsky. But before that, we're going to have Ben and Libby talk about some of their favorite nominees in the limited series races, some things that people should think about before they go into voting, which opens today. Right now. Happy Emmy voting. Yeah, jump in there. Start voting for the things that Libby and Ben tell you to vote for. This is millions and millions of little screens. Can't you shut up? I'm busy. Boy, what a great show. Skipping ahead to the clicker, our recap of the biggest news items from this past week. Uh, before we get to the limited series uh, advocacy that you guys are going to do, Ben really wanted to quickly touch on some things. Nine Perfect Strangers, good or bad? Terrible. Worse okay. than bad. Worse than bad. bad. <laughs> yes, yes. I believe I have a line in there where it's something of the effect of, of, of the, in the review, something of the effect of um, a lot of comparisons have been made that, you know, the White Lotus came first and did it better. Nine Perfect Strangers is another story of rich vacationers at this uh, extravagant retreat, except it doesn't have any satire. It doesn't really have any point. And I said something to the effect of if anyone recommends nine perfect strangers over the white lotus then you can no longer trust them with a tv recommendation not because the white lotus is uh you know impervious to any sort of criticism leo has leveled his own you know very valid criticisms uh, of the show uh, over i think multiple weeks of this podcast uh but because there are just very few shows that are worse than nine perfect strangers i knew nine perfect strangers was going to be bad when i saw the billboard and there are 12 people on the billboard Oh, there's so many, yeah. You got to yeah. Like, how do you get that wrong? If there's a number in the title referring to how many things are going to be in the show or movie, boy, that billboard better have that, the number of things. Three amigos. You want to see three people, not seven. Feels weird well, to see seven people on a three amigos poster. The other thing, like, like poster complaints aside, the implication of nine perfect strangers to me makes it seem like, okay, so the focus really is on these people. Like it's really going to be about kind of how they interact with each other and, and kind of whatever's tied into their individual problems and how this place helps develop them. But the place and the people running it will kind of be this grand mysterious figure. Uh, but no, Nicole Kidman is absolutely a 10th stranger in the show. Like she is somebody who has given just as much of like a weird convoluted, we have to figure out what happened to her before the series started storyline as, as all the other people. And then there's two, you know, staffers at the compound who have the same questions around them, like who are just as integral. And the, I think the only reason they couldn't say that it's 12 perfect strangers instead of nine is because the staffers know Masha that's Nicole Kidman's name. She's Russian and she's named Masha. Uh, sure she is. It's awful. Uh, but yeah, like it's the, the implications of the title are bad on their own. So it's just, it's a mess. Libby, Ben, uh, before we get to those, those uh, advocacy pieces, Ted Lasso Christmas episode. Apparently Ben says it's the most divisive episode of Ted Lasso ever. Can't be true. What it feels like to me. I, I see, I've seen like, the people saying this is their favorite episode of television of all time. Like it makes me so happy. I love it so much. It's so fun. And it's exactly what I wanted right now. And I've seen the people who are like, all right, Ted Lasso's jumped the shark. It went too far. It's so sweet and it spoils it. And I just can't go back now. So like I've seen either end of the reaction, obviously there's reactions in the middle, but uh, the only thing I'd say about it is I don't even think this is the most saccharine episode of the season. I think that's this week's episode, uh, which everybody hasn't seen yet. Uh, and then do you guys want to touch on what John Landgraf did or didn't say at TCA's last Friday? The mayor of television. We love a lot of his programming. We talk about FX nearly constantly on this podcast. What do you uh, say? What do you not say? Is this about well, the, said the info? Main... Is it the data? 
it's the data. Like the main thing is that we all expected, you know, uh, Landgraf to show up with another kind of state of television report when he was doing his executive session during the second FX TCA day of three. Um, and instead he, he kept very strictly to the message of what's going on at FX, what they're trying to do within the network uh, and, and the company, um, because that's really what his job has been, has been focused on of late. And that's because there's other people in charge of some of his former responsibilities now that uh, FX has been fully absorbed by Disney. Uh, so it was a little disappointing. Like you always want to hear what John's thinking in, in broader terms than just what's going on at FX, but the man still delivered. It was still a great panel. I really enjoyed it. Uh, we're getting Atlanta season three and better things season five within the first six months of 2022. Uh, and you know what? That makes me a pretty happy camper. So here we go. I, I, it's upsetting to me because like the most forthcoming and, and uh, knowledgeable, one of the most forthcoming and knowledgeable minds in, in uh, the industry is now employed by Disney, which uh, doesn't love information or sharing it with anyone. So um, it's just, it is, it, I, it's not so much a uh, disappointment in, in land graph, but it's very, it's a stark reminder of of the landscape change of the last few years. And um, it is a little bit scary. Um, it's just a reminder that uh, capitalism is bad. Well, Libby, that so, might segue perfectly into our limited series discussion. I guess you could say both Hamilton and WandaVision kind of crashed the limited series party. So last week we did comedy. <laughs> And we advocated for some of, uh, or you guys, I didn't advocate for shit. You guys advocated for some of some of the people that you think voters should give a second look to in, in the various categories, directing, writing, casting. In terms of limited series, what are some of the nominees that you think voters should take a, a harder look at, whether it be in, you know, the quote unquote main acting categories or across the board in, in the more uh, technical categories? Where do we begin? Well, first Dan, would you foremost, like to start? I heard you had, I heard you had a couple locked and loaded. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, we should point out that I really think that Leo did advocate for breeders on last week's comedy series uh, episode. I think he manages to advocate for breeders every episode of the podcast, if not every conversation that we have on Zoom. Uh, I should really start keeping a tally. That would be fun. Um, but uh, honestly, I'll start with a party crasher, as you put it. Um, to be fair, I I think that by the time the Emmy nominations were coming, a lot of us expected WandaVision to do very, very well, at least in terms of the nomination total. The biggest question was whether or not it would be accepted as like one of the five limited series because there were just so many strong contenders this year. And there is uh, the perception of superhero bias out in the awards world, whether or not that's true. I'm not going to comment on right now. Uh, but one thing we can all agree on is that Katherine Hahn was very, very deserving of her second Emmy nomination. And here's hoping it's going to be her first win. Uh, I obviously have spoken about this performer a number of times on You're this spoken very podcast. To her. I, I have spoken to her. I don't know if we included that on the podcast, but Leo may have cut it in because he's a kind and gentle soul most of the time. Uh, no, award spotlight. The award spotlight series. Oh no, I know, but I was speaking directly about. Oh, this, on the podcast. You're talking about the podcast. podcast that we run and people do listen to. Um, uh-huh. But yeah, no, I, I, I would be very, very pleased to see her pull away with a victory. Um, she's got the body of work, but the work that she did specifically within Wandavision was outstanding. Uh, it was one of those things where you're begging to see more of her every single week. You want that role expanded. You want that, you know, episode expanded so that she has more time to live in that sitcom universe and play the various sitcom characters that she got to inhabit. Um, and the transition was great. The turn was great. Uh, everything about it. She really lived it and I loved every second of it. So I'm hoping the voters do as well. Um, Libby, do you have uh, a less, obvious recommendation perhaps yeah i was gonna say way to go out on a limb and and uh <laughs> name 
arguably the front runner in that category. Uh, Knock on wood. Yeah, but I I have I'm gonna go right for the right for the big boy. Let like let's talk limited series. Uh, the category. This is uh, I mean I mean it's not that this is a bad category. It's just sort of upsetting category and because of the way the other categories kind of shook out I think people really need to choose carefully here um I honestly at this juncture am not sure who the front runner is like intellectually it it's probably the queen's gambit still although it feels like that's a little old news but if we were talking about that uh I mean maybe it's Mare of Easttown regardless those aren't the ones you should be voting for sorry hbo um i would throw your vote behind first of all uh the underground railroad one of the triumphs of this television series um the limited series from barry jenkins on amazon prime video it got painfully overlooked in the supporting categories for some reason as though something was competing in those categories that had no right to be competing there um libby at the risk of at the risk of upsetting you even further let's say hamilton doesn't compete in those categories and the underground railroad doesn't get those spots are you more or less angry that's a good question and i don't know the answer to it i think i'm less angry Really? I think I'd be more angry because like there wasn't even this like stalwart, like juggernaut, like Hamilton that like, of course, this thing was going to suck up, you know, some oxygen. But like the idea that like that thing wasn't there and you still didn't honor. Instead, cast. it's just like Halston. And I mean, that that is what happened in, in actress. There are no lead actresses that got nominated from Hamilton and Tuso still missed and that is very very frustrating to me but all the more reason that people should really be casting their vote for underground railroad because you're gonna lump everyone together then isn't limited series uh the category the ensemble award um and if not that i may destroy you because that is also perfect ben thoughts feelings at the risk of tan tangenting for a little bit and th- i'm the rube obviously but this Queen's Gambit have a little bit of like the the sharp objects uh, sort of like it's a thing that was hot at one moment or uh, escape from Danamora. It's, it's much more escape from Danamora, I think. Um, and that then got scooped by Chernobyl, which is absolutely what we could see here with um Queen's Gambit and Mayor of Town. Right. But then you have that WandaVision wild card out there that I'm very, very nervous about. No, I, I pretty much agree with what you're saying. I, you know, I you always look at the at the total nominations to kind of see how widespread support is throughout the TV Academy when it comes to these major categories that everybody can vote on. And, you know, WandaVision is well out ahead. Uh, Queen's Gambit has a very solid 18. Mayor of Easttown has 16. Um, so you'd, you'd think that those three are kind of the, the front runners duking it out. Um, the thing that always worries me about, well, I mean, <laughs> I should just say the thing that concerns me about WandaVision this year is that I do feel like people treat these categories from time to time as not necessarily voting for the best show, but voting for the show that represents what's happening in TV this year. Like, what will I remember about the state of television? And Oh, the old program of the year from the TCA awards. Yeah, one of the worst things in existence, to be honest with you. Like, I, I despise the existence of, of these kind I of know, uh, thought processes. But um, I do think that that's going to suck up some votes for WandaVision. I think that that's something where um, people within the industry will look to that show as a benchmark and something they want to copy in a million different ways for years to come. Uh, and they'll want to recognize it because of those things. They will admire it as a, as a winner already, as almost opposed to the thing that happens usually at the Oscars, where it's like, um, we're not going to vote for this thing that's got a bajillion dollars because it's already won by having all of that money. Like it's already such a success. We need to bring recognition to something else. I feel like with TV, especially since Game of Thrones has come along, uh, a lot of the voters are much happier just to kind of rally around the thing that everybody already rallied around. Um, So I could see WandaVision winning because of that. 
I'm with Livy in that I do not want to say which one is the actual front runner at this moment. I don't know. I need to dig in a little bit harder, um, but I would 100% advocate for the Underground Railroad. I honestly just think it's a perfect show. Uh, and I've already spoken about it ad nauseum on here. If you haven't been listening, then I encourage you to go back. But honestly, just watch it. Just watch it. If you see it, it's undeniable. And uh, it'd be great if we were all surprised and the Twin Peaks of 2021 stole the limited series category. That would be wonderful. Ben, is there anything else you uh, really want to spotlight in the limited series uh, races? Uh, it, it's all kind of tied into the same idea that I want the Underground Railroad to win something. Um, I think I've talked about it again already on this podcast, but when you look at who's nominated for best director in the limited series category at the Emmys, oh boy. I mean, again, there's, there's a lot of extremely credible, extremely talented people who made great shows like Scott Frank absolutely deserves to be in here. Craig Zobel, so excited for, uh, our leftovers alum to, to get that recognition, uh michaela cole sam miller i may destroy you like libby said wonderful excellent groundbreaking television program um and if one of those two wins like (laughs) great that's honestly fine too if i may destroy you could steal a couple of wins i would be elated uh but it's very hard for me to look at something like the underground railroad which i think is so easy to describe as a vision um, and I, I'm hesitant to say it's one person's vision because not only is Barry Jenkins so adamant about like all of his collaborators influencing every aspect of this work, uh, I do feel like that's something that comes through on screen. I would say that it is his central idea, like his his central vision that kind of brings all of those elements together that they're feeding off of and contributing to and creating and the effort that he put into creating this masterpiece uh i just it's hard for me to imagine not awarding it with the one award that seems undeniable like it i mean especially since it didn't get any acting nominations uh obviously a lot of the craft work you know stands on its own and and deserves those wins too but i think you know if you're trying to just think of a representative win outside of the the overall series category then it's got to be for barry uh so i would would love to see that happen i mean uh, he's really the conductor of that series in in both in in both definitions of the world word. Like, if the Underground Railroad is an orchestra, then he is the one bringing in, um, you know, the lighting and the editing and making sure it's making this beautiful whole. And um, also, he's the conductor in the sense that you know he is driving the train. He is keeping things on track. He's 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 hitting all the stations and uh yeah that's just topical yeah i completely co-signed the 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 problem with these podcasts is that ben and i are generally pretty of a piece i think definitely vote Catherine Hahn. definitely vote jenkins and director i would probably vote michaela cole in writing you know and 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 yeah obviously vote your heart but think hard about where you are putting those votes because it matters now we're going to jump to something we actually talked about last week when Ben advocated for Lucia Aniello to potentially win directing for Hacks, uh, into our conversation with the three co-creators, uh, Lucia Aniello, Paul W. Downs, and Jen Statsky, about everything about Hacks. The look, we talked about Soderbergh, we talked about how to construct jokes, we talked about porn a little bit. A little bit. Without further ado, here's that interview. We here at Million Screens are, are so excited to have the creators of Hacks, Lucia and Yellow, Paul W. Downs, and Jen Statsky. Uh, I hope I didn't ruin any of those names when, when I introduced you guys. And to get things started, I'm going to kick things over to Libby, who you've already spoken to before, and she'll be able to lead us down this primrose path to probably <laughs> insane questions uh, as we go along. Primrose path. Primrose path. That's great, Leo. Guys, I'm going to start with a very basic question uh, because... I, I am very easily confused. Talk me through the process of making this show. What did that timeline look like? When did you sell it? When did you cast it? Sure. When did you write it? And when did you film it? How did it all come together? 
We um, had the initial idea for it about six, a little over six years ago, I think at this point. We were on a road trip um, going up to Portland, Maine because Paul was shooting part of his Netflix character special. And Jen and I were there to tag along and, you know, as joke pitches, pitchers and bodyguards and yeah. uh you they, know we they start- were really they protected me i needed somebody <laughs> to protect me from the fans and i said who are the strongest women i know and- <laughs> i mean that portland maine crowd they're Ooh. rough i tell you well we were at, going to a monster jam world finals of a truck rally so kind of monster jam fans are tough they are yeah but they're cool the family friendly nice people um so yeah that was about six years ago and then we you know had kept like returning to it and talking about it. And we just kind of been, we were like, this is something we just want to make, but we were all, you know, kind of working on other stuff, but something we always return to. And then when the time is right, which I think is two years ago, Jen, Jen's really good with the dates. Um, Yeah. We pitched the show in April and May of 2019. And then we wrote it that fall, the pilot, and then um, (coughs) something called COVID-19 happened. Yeah. (laughs) And so um, player, no. <laughs> it had originally been a pilot order um, and we had attached Gene Smart at that time, which was really exciting. But then when COVID happened, um, we were kind of in this like limbo, but we were so lucky that our fam at HBO Max <laughs> and Universal um, were like, you know what, why don't you just go and write the season um, and we'll see when we can shoot it. And so we wrote it over Zoom with our really gorgeous writer's room. I felt, I don't think that's actually in the press enough is how gorgeous <laughs> these writers are. People yeah. don't always think that, but they're gorgeous. Yeah. We don't know how tall they are because we've never met them, but <laughs> they're, they're gorgeous. Really we did put our heights in our Zoom um, yes. name tags just so people knew because, you know, I don't think people know that I'm 6'4". You know, <laughs> when they hear my voice, they think, hmm. But anyway, all right, so I'll let you, I'll let you ladies continue. So we wrote from, we wrote from, what was that? Like, was it June we started? Yeah. June? June, 2019. Yeah. Until, or 2020, sorry, 2020. June, 2020 until about September. Yeah. 2020. And mm-hmm. then we started shooting in November when COVID oh, okay. was at its nearest peak um, through uh, March, April. 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 Oh, so that. really, really at the height of COVID is when we shot the show. Have you gone to a lot of monster truck rallies? Uh, all of you. <laughs> Two. Two? Yep. Two? That ben? was my, that Portland one was my first one and, and actually my last. <laughs> Your only first and only? only? Yeah. Never last. Never, never last. Though. Maybe, maybe once we get out of this <laughs> pandemic, that'll be the first place I go. <laughs> Not that going to a monster truck rally is dumb, but what is the dumbest thing you have done for comedy? Dedicate my life to it. fair that's fair i feel like you guys have like shot some sketches in insane places i don't what have i done that's dumb yeah jen like is is, i think a safer person in general i think the dumbest thing she's done is come with us on some of our journeys honestly (laughs) um open herself legally to whatever that might entail i used to have a bit i did a, a like a one man show at the Upright Citizens Brigade in New York. And I had a bit where I was a blind person on a Segway. And so I used to have to go back and forth from the theater to the apartment of a person who I rented the Segway from. That was like, it was always, it was always a (laughs) strange experience. And I was, I was asked to do pornography by that person at one, at one point. (laughs) Um, I didn't do it. I turned him down, but, um, Wow. So is the stupidest thing you did turning him down? Or... Thought, you know, would, he thought that I would be big. He thought that I would be big in other countries for some reason. I don't know why. But anyway. Well, you're so tall. <laughs> it's my height. It's yeah. my height. Yeah. Obviously, a lot of the show is built on uh, setting up these jokes as jokes that work in, in this world. But I'm actually sort of wonder about how do you go about workshopping people workshopping jokes Mm -hmm. because obviously in a writer's room the way that that you you build to sort of an apex as people are pitching but then you also have to make sure that you set markers along the way to be like well let's hold that joke that we don't think is right for our tag we're gonna hold it as like a placeholder to build on because we're gonna probably use it as like something that doesn't quite get us to the actual tag in the show if that question makes makes any sense (laughs) makes total sense you know i think one example of us really doing that was in the scene where Ava reveals the um, the joke she made about that closeted senator who sends right. us into conversion therapy in the pilot, there is no line. And then it sort of lights a fire in Deborah, and she 
pitches on it and then Ava comes back and then Deborah has a, another punch up on it. And we, we wrote so many versions of that and so many iterations of that joke that's, that I think the one that ends up being Deborah's, uh, this is the one, might have been in, in the middle of that process. And we were like, actually, that's the best one. Let's save that to last and let's work backwards to kind of give it the iterate, iterative steps it needs mm-hmm. to get to that place. But that is a really, it is a real Rubik's cube of figuring out when you're writing about the progression of a joke, how you start not so good and how you get better. It's complicated. Yeah. I I was wondering if like, especially in a zoom room, if that energy is like, Hey, we're all in this, we're all in this duck. Everyone write your alts on this joke. Everyone write your alts on Ava's Twitter joke. And then, so you just have this list of a hundred jokes like, and you're, and you're bulleting like, this is the final, but what are the ones that lead up to this in a nice, in a nice fashion? That is very much what we do. I mean, we often will like workshop that stuff in the room and we're all zooming together, but we do sometimes send writers off to just do alts. And we also had a couple people this season who were only joke punch up writers who were never in the room. So it really can come from kind of anybody. But then, yes, we're oftentimes like, okay, here's the second and the third, but what's the first that gets you there? And and the other thing that makes the show even one more level of complicated is we're not necessarily always saying this is the best joke ever. We're often saying this is the kind of joke this person would make based on where they're at in their lives or in their path with comedy or whatever. So it's not like we're necessarily saying like, oh my God, Ava's this aside Ava does are just like the funniest things in the world. We're like, well, they are funny because that's how she would do her jokes. It's not, we're not saying that like that is the apex of comedy. We're just like, that's her point of view. That's how she would talk. That's to us. It's more important sometimes for the jokes to be more accurate to character than necessarily saying to the world, like these are like, move over Seinfeld. You know what I mean? It's like, that's not kind of our, our point. I think it's really like, here's where these, the jokes are a reflection of of these people. And to us, it's character first. Yeah. Cause you know, I think in, in the show, there's a lot of obviously stand up, And so there are set up punchline jokes, but at least I'll speak for myself personally. Some of my favorite jokes are just character jokes that are dialogue jokes. So even in that interview scene in the pilot with Ava and Deborah, um, she says, Oh, you've seen my sitcom from 1971. And Ava says, well, I've seen clips. And Deborah says, clips, wonderful. And that to me is a joke, you know, just her responding in the way that she's like, huh, is, you know, is almost something that makes me laugh more so than when you see Deborah on stage doing her act. Understanding that like so much of that is rooted in character, like so many of the jokes themselves are, are rooted in like who they are and where they are in their life. At the same time, one of the things that always, I always think about when people are writing a show about the industry, like about, you know, especially comedy writers, like, did you feel pressure to live up to a certain expectation? Like when you released this out into the world, were you waiting to hear like from your fellow comedy writers or anyone in particular, like, oh man, that is how it is. Like, did you want that kind of industry feedback? Yeah. I mean, I think we, we feel good about the way it's been received by, you know, friends of ours and colleagues who are comedy writers, who I I think it feels like an accurate portrayal. I mean, I think it's an interesting thing because it seems like there's maybe preconceived notions from people about how comedians talk or like the workshopping. I think that we, we try to be really selective about showing it because honestly, if you put a camera on the three of us working, I think it would be fun, but it's not that fun (laughs) like you know writing comedy it's like it is like I think there maybe is a perception that like they should be so funny all the time because they're comedians so every single thing as they're workshopping should be hilarious and I can tell you from experience that's not how it works (laughs) I promise Jen says you know I can tell you from experience there's a lot of tears a lot of a lot of yelling and screaming and uh so I don't know I, I think we we honestly feel happy with the reception from our peers because it feels like an accurate depiction of comedy writers. I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah, yeah but I, our- I was going to add that it's really been so gratifying, I think, for us because, you know, we always wanted the show to be a love letter to women like Deborah Vance, you know, women who um, persevered and got knocked down but got back up again so many times, especially in the world of comedy. For me, the thing that I have been so, like, happy to see is people like, Kathy Griffin or Rosie O'Donnell or Carol Liefer or these amazing comedians who are like, I love this show because it feels well-observed to them. And so, you know, that's something that I, th- I think is really special to us. 
Uh, well, to pivot a little bit, uh, Lucia, I I've been privy to some of the interviews you did with our crafts uh, editor, yeah. Crystal Fault, for our crafts consideration piece. I love Chris. And there was a tidbit you dropped that I mostly want to ask about just so I can watch Ben's reaction to your answer. But you were talking about the look and feel of Soderbergh's Las Vegas and using that as a visual uh, sort of reference for what you were trying to, to, to do with Hax's Vegas. And if you could just sort of speak on using that as, as, a, as a blueprint and also what you just enjoy about Soderbergh's work so that Ben can just, you know, gleefully grin from ear to ear. <laughs> I mean, he's, you know, I would say probably my favorite director, and I'll tell you why, <laughs> is <laughs> because I really feel like he's constantly adapting his visual language for the story in a way that is so egoless and is so always about telling the story through the characters and in a way that, yeah, like, I, I love that I can... I can see a, a, a Soderbergh movie, not know he necessarily directed it, but only know that it's so good that I'm going to guess that he directed it. <laughs> um, because that to me is always the, like, I, I listen, I have such a great love for so many auteurs who, who tend to replicate their visual language. But to me, that's, you know, I try to be somebody who really tries to take myself and what I tend to do out of it and try to say like, well, what do we, these characters need? What does this story need? What does this shot need? How do these characters feel? And how can I replicate that with my shots or with my framing or with, with the lens choices even or, or anything? And so to me, like that, that's really what I love about Soderbergh so much. And yes, in terms of his his Vegas, I feel like, you know, the oceans, they're just so fun and they're so playful. And I think that that's also something that was really important to the show is that I think there is like so much fun, like gleeful, like enjoyable candy to it. But of course there's something beneath it. There's the darkness, there's the underbelly that, that Vegas has. And I think you see that reflected in a character like Deborah, especially, but, but I also think that of course, Soderbergh always manages to show the dark and the light and everything as well, because he's the best. I love you, Steven. <laughs> Same with Behind the Candelabra. Of course, yeah. that was a huge visual reference for us. And we talked about it all the time. Something that is like fun and beautiful and funny. That's also, I feel like so much of his work is so funny. And he's kind of like not necessarily talked about as one of the great comedic directors, but to me, absolutely. Well, How to do Ben. <laughs> Ben looks really good. Sorry, I had a I had a uh, an ambulance going by, but you did fantastic. I am just a, a huge fan as well, and like hearing that comparison for the first time, and then kind of watching those and thinking about those pieces together, uh, it it was just a lot of fun for me. So uh, I just love it. Well, no spoilers, but obviously your visual reference for season two will be Chloe Zhao and Nomadland, correct? In this in this road trip, Absolutely. I'm assuming. Uh, a lot of super wide, uh, really beautiful panoramic shots as as Deborah and Ava trek across the country no hmu honey that's it we're not going we're not doing it it's full raw it's, it's gonna I, be gorgeous <laughs> i brought this up only uh somewhat jokingly because i think ben had a bone to pick with y'all for for dropping this amazing premise at the end of your season and then cutting to black and being like wait a year <laughs> bye it's 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 honestly just one of those things where you know, when you're so hooked into a show and then it ends after teasing something that you're so excited to see, it just hurts all the more. <laughs> and I know that you already apologized to Libby on, <laughs> on behalf of this issue. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for that and also beg you to please, as soon as those <laughs> shots are available, as soon as those episodes come out, please send them our way. I'm, I'm dying. And it's, it's a testament. Like the, the end of this season is one of the things that I admired so much about I mean, your work in general, but especially when it came to Hacks, in that you were able to give this initial story a definitive ending and yet still continue it in a way that is, you know, so specific to television. Like it's, it's, you're so eager to see what happens next. And yet you also feel satisfied by where it went. It was just that the, the what's next part was so good that I'm, I'm dying a little bit. Thank you. And we're so sorry. So sorry. <laughs> if it's any consolation, you can tell the background walls of all three of our computers are the same because we are in the same space. Cause we are working on season two Pretty very sure much right that. now. As soon as we can. Yeah, we will you send them better email. be. As soon as we, oh yes, every day. Are. You have 15 Emmy nominations. Like that's wild when you wake up that morning. Cause I think with the pandemic and with streaming, it's hard to really gauge what kind of penetration a, a show has at this juncture. What is that like waking up that morning and 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 having that news uh, wash over you? It's really hard to even 
kind of put wrap your brain around it, honestly, because there are so many people that were recognized for their hard work. And we saw up and, you know, up close, like how talented everyone is, how hard they worked, especially during COVID. I mean, we really all pushed ourselves and each other to, to try to make this feel like something that you would have no idea was done during a, a pandemic. But to be able to like, it's easier for me to like wrap my head around it, like for Kathleen Felix Hager, who did our costumes design, for example, and be like, God, I'm so happy for her. Like it's easier kind of to like wrap around how you feel about it for other people right. than I think for ourselves. Um, but also like, yeah, like I don't, 15 is also a very, very crazy number. <laughs> and that feels like, I don't know. It's, it's exciting. I don't know. What What are the words, guys? It's exactly what Lucia said. It's like, it, for me too, and I, and I don't mean to speak for Paul, but I think Paul did. Like, it's so, you know, making this show was such a labor of love for everybody. And they, they like poured themselves into it. And it really was so challenging to make this show during the time it was made. And so you hope that those people were already feeling appreciated and, and recognized. But to, to have everyone really like almost every department get recognized was just like so gratifying and special. And, and yeah, something I think will be really proud of for the rest of our lives, honestly. Yeah. yeah. I think Jen said what I was going to say perfectly. She's always speaking for me well, as <laughs> is Lucia. But, you know, the, the only other thing I'd say is that you hear from friends or, or you see people post about the show and you're like, oh, great. This is something that people feel seen by or that's resonating with people. But then when something like that happens and for all of these departments to be recognized and for there to be 15, we were like, what? It did really feel like, oh, wow, this is even maybe more than we we realized, you know, mm -hmm. um, in terms Definitely. of the response, we, we, we were shocked. We were shocked and floored and yes. so happy. The photo in the finale of young Hannah, uh, the, yeah. the hands, yeah. uh, are Hannah's hands disproportionately <laughs> large? Um, was that why she was cast? Uh, I mean, just, 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 I mean, we couldn't it. see her face crazy. till her first day on set. We <laughs> cast hands exclusively for tape. You know, I gotta oh, say, well, this is a question we haven't gotten and I've been waiting for it. <laughs> it's so funny because, and you know, sometimes when, when you're auditioning for a commercial or something like that, you, you show your hands, you're like, I have no tattoos or whatever. We did not do that. We did not know, <laughs> we had written the hands joke before Hannah was cast Way and before. we didn't know about her hands. But I will say that I have to get my charger. So I'm going to let, I'm going <laughs> to let Oh, I see. Like, well, I there, uh, what no, a I mean, This is raw. I, I will this say is when, during, This is raw. During the screen test, did I take a glance down at the hands? Yeah, I did. Because <laughs> I hadn't seen them in person. And did I think the, the hand, the, listen, her hands are perfectly proportional to her body, but they also worked you know, for the joke. But that photo where you see her hand on that very large, I don't even know what it is, pipe. It looks like, a, like pipe a bomb. <laughs> yeah, what is that? It's a bonnery, she, she, she was, said. She was at Coachella. Oh, Coachella. At like a 12-year-old. Yeah. Well, her mom's into like raves and stuff. So I think they like it <laughs> together. Yeah. But, um, and those that... mother-daughter raves, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that oh, yeah. photo is real. We didn't we didn't Photoshop it at all. It is 100% a true real 100 photo. 100% real. We oh. just took it and printed it and that was it. So the fact that that photo of that little girl's hands that emphasize the hands exists and we didn't know until way after we cast her. I mean, that's the magic that is 15 Emmys right there. <laughs> <laughs> a higher power and that higher yeah. power. Something else is at work here. It, may, it, it, it turned photo. me from atheist to agnostic, actually. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know how, I, I don't know what other choice you had to be, to be completely honest. There's an unmoved mover making sure that her hands were that large in that photo as a child. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. That solved one of the bigger mysteries of, of the, at least of the finale, if not the entire series for me. <laughs> I had the same question about the photo of what, what it was. I was like, what is she, what is her hand up against? And then because it was Gene Smart holding the photo and because this had come out after Watchmen, my first thought was, is this a joke about the blue vibrator? Is this what this yeah, is? Not, yeah, Pete, we saw that people were saying that online. That's no, totally and it was. Was, it was a, it was a <laughs> We do do yeah. Easter eggs and people should look out for more of them. Okay. There's a lot of hidden stuff. Like that. As someone who worked at the onion in Chicago, when we didn't oh. have any money, what was it like <laughs> working on ONN when there was money? That was like, Oh, that's the golden years. That's when people could actually do things uh, at the onion. It's supposed to spend $150 per video. I'll say this. I was an assistant. So it didn't feel like there was money to me. 
<laughs> that's that was uh but i mean yeah that was wait so you worked you worked at the paper in chicago yeah i worked at the paper in chicago cool. i wasn't part of the of the scab uh move over i, I, I was <laughs> i was hired in chicago got um, it, got it. yeah i i love the onion man i i really loved my time there even though uh the tv like that was a weird when i was an assistant there it was like at this very same time it was like okay go make an onion show for ifc go make an onion show for comedy central they were happening at the exact same time with the same showrunner who had it like which was crazy to do it i think they're very funny shows if you go back and watch but it was not set up for success i'll say that thank you so much for for spending time with millions of secrets uh <laughs> our spin-off <laughs> podcast uh where we talk about the, the very secrets that go into making your favorite television shows um uh but yeah it was our a, title <laughs> It was it was yeah. a pleasure. It's our fault for having an awful podcast title. No, oh, I don't no, think so. No, no, talk no, about no. it. <laughs> so oh, God, that's, a, that's an off the now. pod story. It's right. based on a on a YouTube video of Bjork talking about how televisions work, and it's a the quote she says. Oh. Everybody, I love that. that. I love yeah. that. Cool. Right. There it is. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Here, bye, guys. And that was our conversation. With Uchia, Paul, and Jen, uh, again, Hacks nominated for 15 Emmys. Vote your heart. Vote what we tell you to vote. I guess there's different things. Just vote what we tell you to vote. Vote <laughs> Hacks. Millions of Screens is a production of the Penske Media Corporation. Anywhere are theme music features experts, the classic YouTube, Bjork talking about TV and Willie Wonka and Chocolate Factory. We talked about that, too. Our editor-in-chief is Dan harris Brightson. Our publisher is James Israel. And our executive editor is... TBD. Some of our favorite movies whose posters feature a number and the correct amount of people on the poster. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. <laughs> it's just Jack Nicholson. No ratchet on that poster. Just Jack Nicholson. He's the one who flew over the cuckoo's nest. Lock, stock, and two smoking barrels. Yes, there are five people on the poster, but there are only two guns, two barrels of two guns. Uh, and two for the money, featuring Matthew McConaughey and Al Pacino. Millions of Screens tepidly endorses Three Amigos, which the aforementioned Three Amigos, which features Chevy Chase, Steve Martin, and Martin Short. Three Kings, which has its, its three main characters uh, uh, on, the, on the poster. And Three to Tango, featuring Matthew Perry, Nev Campbell, and Dylan McDermott. Not Dermot Mulroney, Dylan McDermott. The better one, yeah. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at a million screens at Midwest with fire at Ben T Travers at Leo Nusia. You can find us on that podcast, Spotify, Google Play, so leave me and let us know what you think. If it's good, we might read it on the air. And if it's bad, we'll try our best to delete it from the internet. This is Ben, Libby and Leo remind you as always, they shouldn't let poets lie to you. You shouldn't let poets lie to you. Ain't nothing wrong with a couple of cold brews and a cool podcast. <laughs>